So, I've never been on hallucinogens before, but after watching this Nicolas Cage film, I'm convinced that I just was. If you take a horror movie and wrap it around an acid trip fantasy impregnated by a rock and roll anthem, then you basically have Mandy. It's John Carpenter, Lovecraft, Mad Max, Texas Chainsaw, and 70s, 80s exploitation grindhouse all wrapped into one incredibly pulpy joint that long after it's over, you'll still be wrapping your disorientated head around what just happened, and I guess that's why I'm here. Mandy tells the story of, well, Mandy, a sentimental and meditative hippie-esque painter who one day, along with her lover Red, are attacked by a gang of delusional cultists and sadistic bikers, and what ensues is a psychedelic revenge thriller. I don't want to say anything too specific just yet because the movie is essentially broken into two parts, and to spoil one part would inevitably spoil the other, so you're going to have to go on a bit of a journey with me, which is fitting to a story that's ultimately more about the journey than the destination. Now, let's get this out of the way before we dive into Mandy. When people hear this is a Nicky Cage film, they might get this sort of meme impression that it's this zany, campy, and just Nick Cage throwing everything into it, and while you're technically not wrong, he gives a wonderful performance, it is a little disingenuous to say it's entirely his film. While the story does eventually revolve around his character Red, Andrea Riseborough's titular Mandy deserves just as much if not more attention because, for its grungy, gruesome gore to work on a visceral and even gratifying level, the fantastical love story it's built upon needs to be fiercely worth investing in. Mandy will definitely not be for everyone, but for those who might initially dismiss it as style over substance, like I admittedly did when I watched it upon release and got swept up in the overhype, it's an earnestly thoughtful and intelligent film, with legitimate meaning behind its visual style that you can interpret in a magnitude of different ways. As such, I'm particularly curious to hear your thoughts and comments on how events play out, because I'm still processing it, but I feel I have just enough to say to at least paint a picture of the beautifully haunting landscape that is uniquely Mandy. Now, as you may know, videos like this can make YouTube a bit trigger happy, so before we begin, I want to give a very thankful shout out to this video's sponsor, Surfshark. Surfshark is a virtual private network that masks your IP address and allows you to connect to any country in the world so you can anonymously and safely surf the web without falling prey to other nefarious fish in the sea or being trapped in the fishing net of geographical restriction. For example, if you're using public Wi-Fi in a cafe or hotel and want to better protect your passwords and access sensitive information, Surfshark encrypts your data to keep it confidential and secure, and because they use RAM-only servers, you'll have greater peace of mind knowing that once you disconnect, Surfshark doesn't store that information. However, for us horror fans wanting to get more value out of our streaming services, by changing to another country, you can unlock an entirely new selection of films and shows previously unavailable to you. For example, if I switch to a Canadian server and refresh Shutter, I can access the topic of this video Mandy, along with a wide range of wonderful gems like Texas Chainsaw, Perfect Blue, and Train to Busan that aren't available here on Shutter. Shutter UK, so I like to think of Surfshark as turning a set menu into an all-you-can-eat buffet. Surfshark gives you one subscription with unlimited devices, so you can share the love with your friends and family without any arbitrary restrictions. And with a 30-day money-back guarantee and 24-7 customer support, there is no better time to try Surfshark VPN today than by using my code Ryan Hollinger for three extra months for free. Set in the Shadow Mountains of Nirvana in 1983, Mandy's first half focuses on Red and Mandy enjoying their time together in the embrace of the peaceful wilderness. The recurring use of a delicate, bittersweet score helps convey a constant undercurrent to their pure, free-spirited ways, as a looming sense of fear begins to shadow over Mandy, as she seemingly has premonitions of something bad just out of sight. Their love for each other is sustained with a subtle sincerity that makes the simple softness of their scenes together remind me of those perfect moments of happiness I share with my own partner, where all the fears, stresses, and worries just wash away so we can harmoniously live in the moment. Mandy's art is symbolic for how she values life, nature, purity, and complete freedom from the confinement and status quo of a conservative 1980s America, which we hear on the radio during Red's drive home from 
work. On it, a religious commentator preaches about the great spiritual awakening in America, which ironically is less about the true freedom we all desire as humans, and more about reinforcing ideology that restricts said freedom, and disapproves of people being able to live their lives in the way that they want. Red rejects this by switching off the radio, not allowing it to interfere with he and Mandy's personal heaven. But of course, the biblical overtones go from metaphorical to quite literal, with the unwanted arrival of the children of the new dawn. This false religious sect essentially reinforces the notion of religion being used as a weapon of control and ideology, as its psychopathic leader Jeremiah Sand sees himself as a human embodiment of God, who has permission to take all that he wants, including Mandy. Now, I don't want to make it sound like I'm criticising Christianity or belief systems through my reading of the film, I'm absolutely far from it, because the point I think it makes is less about the actual beliefs themselves, and more about how certain individuals manipulate and dictate a message that gives meaning to many people's lives. As I said, it's very clear in establishing how religion is weaponized by Jeremiah, who is an obvious play on Charles Manson, made glaringly obvious when it's revealed he's a field musician. He preys on vulnerable, impressionable minds who simply seek acknowledgement and purpose for their existence and what comes next, yet never actually provides them with the true message of salvation. He makes them feel important with titles like brother and sister, but never enough to make them capable of coping with a strange and scary world without him. Their arrival is heavily foreshadowed throughout our time with Red and Mandy, as we have Red chopping down trees to a murky, poisonous colour palette, followed by Mandy finding a dead baby deer, to the image of Red watching Mandy across a roaring fire. It shows us innocence dying, the rot of man slowly seeping its way into natural harmony. I'm saying it like this because the first half of Mandy is framed almost entirely through her subjective perception of the world. It's a tranquil dreamscape being slowly overshadowed by a nightmare. One might say she's a little naive, a bit too haphazard in a life that, in terms of productivity and output, however you may define that, doesn't mean anything or aspire for the purpose that Jeremiah and his cultists want. However, she and Red already have of everything that they want, the peace and solitude of each other. To further build towards the cultists and what they symbolise, Mandy tells Red of a childhood story about how her father made her watch as he killed baby starling birds just because he hated them, and Mandy's only response was to run away because what else can true innocence which Mandy embodies do? It takes some form of internal corruption, a side willing to forgo passivity and the essence of of morality to fight back, which is certainly Red's case in the second half, when someone even tells him he holds a cosmic darkness within himself. We'll explore this point later, but for now, we have Jeremiah, who thinks he's an embodiment of God, Mandy, who we can say does embody innocence, and then we have Red, a recovering alcoholic whose past alludes to a darker place that's suppressed by the nature and harmony of Mandy. Mandy's story about her father Father encapsulates the true horror of the film. There's sometimes no purpose behind hate and violence, like her father killing birds just because they annoy him, but passing it off as teaching your children to fend for themselves by killing defenseless innocent creatures? Some people just want to see the world burn, but lie to themselves and others claiming there's a meaning to justify it, which describes Jeremiah perfectly because he constantly tells himself there's a divine reason for his wickedness. Jeremiah demands his followers to abduct Mandy by using the mysterious horn of Abraxas, Abraxas being this confusing, abstract, yet to be deciphered word, denoting to many beliefs and spiritual ideas, to summon a demonic biker gang to assist them called the Black Skulls. Yeah, at this point, you're either with it or you're not. For a guy wanting to pose himself as a god, Jeremiah reveals his own hypocrisy by hiring demons straight out of Hellraiser who accept 
accept payment in the form of blood. However, there is more to them that I'll reveal later on. They reminded me of a significantly more heightened version of the plague from Hobo with a Shotgun, which in that film were these sadistic, armor-wearing, Michael Myers-esque forces of nature that just murdered everyone in their path. The same is kinda true here when they help the cultists capture Mandy and Red, leading to Jeremiah boasting over his narcissistic god complex, which Mandy flat out rejects despite being laced with tainted LSD, stunning Jeremiah at her ability to see through his illusion and exposing the weak, insecure, pathetic, desperate man he truly is. Part 2 of Mandy takes a significantly distinct turn when the biblical and fantastical allegorical visuals are stripped away to reveal the real world through the eyes of Red. We switch to his perspective as he's crucified with barbed wire and stabbed in the side to mirror Jesus on the cross, soon breaking down in anguish after witnessing Mandy being burned alive before him. To Jeremiah, it's to cleanse her for rejecting her supposed God, whose disciples are willing to die for him. The authoritative religious state that Red and Mandy rejected has basically come to unjustly punish and depravedly destroy their purity and innocence. In retaliation, a furious Red transforms into death, collecting his fittingly named Reaper crossbow from an old friend called Crothers and tracking down those who wronged him, the blood-soaked title of the film now appearing on screen. The absolute genius of part 2 is that it demystifies the established world through Red's eyes. When he meets Crothers, he explains the situation for what it is. Jesus freaks and gnarly bikers who became sadomasochists after ingesting too much highly potent and badly tainted LSD. That's right, their demonic presence and the jar of blood given to them as payment? They're nothing more than dangerously warped drug addicts. Don't get me wrong, they're still threatening, but it's so brilliant that for such a Lovecraftian setup, the world is ultimately a real, grounded place portrayed through one person's lucid perspective. Now, I'm sure some of you are still hung up on the fact that I technically did just compare Nick Cage to Jesus being crucified and resurrected to punish the sinful. That is one way to look at it, but with the switch to Red's point of view, it's more so a man who has reawakened his inner demons to fight evil and fall down a deeper, dire rabbit hole, which Crothers states have the odds stacked against him. It's obviously not pretty. During his crusade, he downs a bottle of vodka, takes the drugs he finds at the biker's lair, and generally speaking, embraces that internal corruption I mentioned earlier. He goes on to craft a glorious axe, because why not, but it works as a way of tying into Mandy's fantasy illusions, especially regarding a book she was reading called Seeker of the Serpent Eye, which talks of a war Warlock embracing some sort of cosmic light. He kills the bikers in modestly quick succession now that they're revealed to be nothing more than kinky drug addicts and proceeds to trip balls on the dodgy LSD, in other words the cosmic light so to speak, revealing visions of a radio tower that's home to the elusive chemist, who of course is played by the always sinister Richard Brake. However, it turns into a surprisingly tender scene when the chemist takes pity on Red after seeing the cosmic darkness he exudes and reveals the location of the cultists. The chemist then releases his caged tiger which calls back to Mandy's paintings and the freedom of confinement she so desired. Red doesn't even say a word in this scene, his bloodied face says it all, and at this point I began to realise perhaps there was something otherworldly about this place. As soon after, Red executes the cultists one by one, before finally confronting Jeremiah. Now, there is a small detail I omitted from earlier where the blade Red is stabbed with is said to be tainted by an unfathomable abyss, suggesting what these religious fanatics conjured from their blasphemy wasn't so much a man consumed by rage and vengeance, but a true demon capable of destruction. Red is beyond redemption or salvation, he is death incarnated. 
Like Mandy, Jeremiah's domineering presence has no effect on Red, and so he begins begging for mercy while trying to once again use religion to make Red's journey seem as if by design, a call to salvation, a purpose. Yet Red ignores him because Jeremiah has no real power, he never did, and gripping Jeremiah's head before crushing his skull with his bare hands, Red declares he is Jeremiah's god now. It is a beautifully haunting payoff, as I still ponder the bitter sweetness of the ending. This isn't a revenge is never sweet style film, because technically by killing those who wronged him, it does bring Mandy back, at least spiritually. As Red leaves after burning down the church, his face covered in blood, a gleaming smile on his LSD stricken face, you're left questioning if he's too far gone, and fully embrace the darkness he once escaped when he first met Mandy, an innocence that both figuratively and literally changed his world. It's not so much that he's let go of his innocence as it was taken away from him. He will forever have his fantasy, his perfect heaven with Mandy, who lives on through him, a dark passenger to his relapse back into addiction. The final shot shows us a Lovecraftian otherworldliness left in Red's wake, a detachment from the reality he brought us back into after Mandy's death, suggesting the road he's further following down leads into that cosmic darkness he just reaped over the world.